just it was such a how did the can of pop it didn't show that it was a bomb wasn't there there doesn't something when they look at when you when you bring your packages your with your luggage and everything the else. bomb got onto the plane from a baggage handler who didn't go through the sorts of screening that you and I go through when we travel or the, the baggage, had or the baggage handler was part of it that's what I just said yeah. the baggage handler didn't have it put it onto the baggage as opposed to it going through the machine but I mean that I, not, I wasn't talking about that he didn't put it but he probably was paid off well, to do it yeah. I mean it was a, it was obviously an inside job that is that is correct okay. so this puts pressure on Putin because now the Russian people are going hey those are you know 200 of our of our comrades which is why sadly the event that happened earlier today where the Russian plane was shot down now two Russian pilots have been killed that is the sort of thing that makes any country angry when its pilots are killed particularly in those circumstances think about how angry we'd be if a plane that we said well it's not really violating the airspace but you shot it down and you killed our pilots imagine the the vitriol that would come from our population. So Putin will be under pressure for that, sadly. But he's also under pressure from all those people that, all his people that died on that airplane. Is, well, I wonder, which, which one do you think he's getting a little bit more uh, angrier at? Uh, he's the, the angry second at the, one? The, he's getting angrier at the second one. Okay. Even um, though it, only two people died on that one, where the other one, what did you say, about 200 and ex yeah. Some Re remember the old quotation from Stalin, if one or two people die, it's sad. If a million die, it's a statistic. I so if we take that logic and apply it to 200 people in an airplane, as awful as that is, it's a statistic. Two pilots, and, you, and we already have seen footage of the one pilot coming down in his chute. That becomes a tragedy because it's only one or two and it can be personalized. So in terms of what Putin's trying to ac accomplish in Syria, and the fact that he w doesn't want to have to argue against Turkey, that's much more immediate and that would put more pressure on him. And where do you see Assad in all this? Do you think he's going to stay in power? And if he does stay in power, how long do you see him in power? And if he gets out, if he's out of power, who will take his place? I mean, will it be uh, some kind of a, a radical per, you know? Uh, what, what, what's going to you see happening in uh, Syria? We can't speculate. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I would predict, in terms of Assad, that he will remain in power. He will remain in power when ISIS is defeated, which I hope that they are. And then there will be some sort of a transition where Assad leaves, gets to go somewhere and, you know, in retirement. And then there's a process of some sort of an election that takes place. There aren't any political parties in Syria that are going to be able to take over. In Egypt, at least, there was the Muslim Brotherhood, which was organized like a party, and they won the election. In Syria, assuming the fighting stops, there isn't anything that's equivalent to that. Or they may be, or maybe he'll become like a seat. He's president now. Putin was sometimes president, and sometimes Putin is prime minister. So maybe he'll be a prime minister. I don't even know. The what Russian Constitution there. allows Putin some flexibility of going back and forth, so he doesn't succeed himself. So whatever job Putin has, he's in charge. That's well. Easy. I see Assad becoming that way as well. No, I, 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 that's Assad doesn't have that sort of support. He has military support. He has Russian support, and when. ISIS is eliminated and the coalition has done that, the pressure will be on him to leave and he will. How do you see ISIS being eliminated? There's only one way and it is, it is painful because it's boots on the ground which means infantry. Now, whether that infantry is going to be Kurdish, that we actually arm the Kurds, which by the way offends Turkey because Turkey doesn't want the Kurds to be any stronger militarily, but we need somebody's boots on the ground. Part of what Hollande was talking about, at least in his pre-meeting with Obama today, was talking about was an active and effective military on the ground coalition. That will be necessary. Those of you who, who study military activity know that air power by itself isn't going to win a war like this. You need boots on the ground at the moment. Kurds are a good but, candidate. But you're also talking about Syria. We, I ISIS, ISIS is all over now. It isn't just in Syria. ISIS is in, in many different countries. I mean, we have cells in the United States. Look what happened in France. There are cells there. I mean, they're lone wolves, a lot of lone wolves, but they were all trained by ISIS in some capacity. Either they went over there and they became terrorists, or they 
they have these they have these books that how to be a terrorist. I mean, there there are a lot of different you know countries now that have ISIS, and they're very proud to be part of ISIS. And how do we eliminate these these suicide bombers that are you know? I you mean, you understand? You just asked a five part impossible to answer question. So let me go back to two of the parts that you asked near the I'd beginning. I'd love to do that. To, I'd love and to let's do, go back to I'd two love of to the do parts. that with this college professor. Thank you. Okay. Let's go back to two of the things you asked. ISIS has to be fought at two levels. First of all, they have to be physically destroyed. The area that they tentatively had called their caliphate needs to be physically destroyed. The second part, and this will be much harder than the first part, the second part is what are the motivations that lead people to be attracted to that sort of violent behavior? That's going to be longer. That's going to be more complex for us to have to go after. But we can't allow, my opinion, we can't allow ISIS to have a protected area, to the extent that it's protected, from which they can support and launch other terrorist attacks. We can't allow that to happen. When Francois Hollande said, we are at war, he is correct. When you are at war, you eliminate the person you're fighting with. We have to physically remove them. It's going to take infantry to do it. And then we have to go over the causes. What is it about the West that causes a significant amount of folks in the Middle East to hate us so much? Well, that's going to that's going to be hard. It's interesting. We're allowing so many migrants to come in from Syria. They not in the U.S. We aren't. Oh my goodness, we're, we put up enough barriers. We're not letting them in the U.S. Well, the poor folks in Europe are the ones who let them in, and they did a very gracious and wonderful humanitarian job. We yeah, but look, barely said ten thousand, and then we started arguing about, wow, that's way too many. We haven't done much yet. Okay, but look what happened in France and Germany, who has allowed many. Okay, many of the migrants, of course, are really nice, decent people. However, we don't know. There were so many of them that were trained very early on in their childhood to hate the West, to hate democracy, to, to hate the United States, to, tr to hate anybody from our country or countries that, that promote our type of democracy. And, and I don't understand. If we're letting all these people in, I don't understand why Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all these other countries would be much they would be more comfortable. The culture is very similar to theirs, and yet we're allowing all these people to come into okay. a culture okay. that they First do all, not like. We aren't allowing people in. The United States is not allowing people in. The well, small President trickle, Obama said that he, they're coming in. No, what he said was in three years, perhaps we'll let in as many as a few tens of thousands. We aren't letting Syrians in right now. Europe is letting Syrians in. Let's understand clearly that the war in Syria is the root cause of the migrant crisis, that over 55% of Syria, Syrian people, have left their country and fled. Germany was nice to take them. Germany has a population problem. As you know, their population has been going down. They need more workers. They're happy to but take them. That's fleeing? humanitarian. Why aren't they standing up for their because country? Because when you and, and, look up at a barrel bomb which is coming down country. into your home, and the barrel bomb doesn't really care if you're Muslim or Christian or Jewish, you're going to leave. And Assad, who's been bombing his own people, has caused, to a large degree, those folks to leave as well as people who didn't want to live under ISIS. So they're fleeing because they believe that they will be killed. I understand the reason for their flight, but we have to fix the cause of that right. flight. That gets back to ISIS. Moving to Europe, I'm very proud of what Germany has done, but there needs to be some sort of vetting process. It needs to be accelerated, but there needs to be a vetting process. You can't just let everyone in regardless. There because are people many coming are from and, Afghanistan, and they're et undocumented. They don't have any documentation. They're papers at all. That's no correct. Papers. And a lot but of them have forged papers. The willingness to let them in because the great majority is humanitarian, that is a wonderful thing for the countries of Europe to do. They're having some difficulty because they're overwhelmed with well, They're going to have to feed them. The way, they're going to have to They're going to have to work. They're, they're going to have to be houses, shelter, in the Middle food. East which are, which are, by the way, taking in uh, refugees. The country of Jordan, at the last statistic I saw, the country of Jordan's population is now 30% refugees. Three out of every 10 people in Jordan are a refugee, and they are getting a small amount of help from us. The King of Jordan has said, I don't have any more money to help the refugees. Please help me. So the UN sent them a couple dollars. We sent them a couple of nickels. That was nice. So I am surprised that some of the countries in the region aren't doing anything. But certainly Jordan is, and they should be commended. Well, let's go back. We have just a couple of more minutes, and I'm going to have to invite you back because this should be a two-hour show, not a, a half-hour show. But a lot of the Army Chief of Staff, uh, we, two of our generals, General Raymond 
Od Odierno and uh, U.S. Marine Corps General Joseph Dunford both say that Russia is the most dangerous military threat to the U.S. Gary, you have a couple of minutes to defend Russia poses the most dangerous military threat to the U.S. General, he says that Russia uh, is, it, that we're facing today because he estimated that a third of the United States brigades are capable of operating at the same level of Russians' hybrid warfare tactics. What do you say about this? Which nation spends the most money on its military? The answer is the U.S. The U.S. spends as much money on its military as the next five nations added together. We are a war machine in terms of where we spend our dollars. So I would say to the generals, who again have better sources than I do, I would say to the generals that if we don't have the right sorts of units to fight against the people we perceive to be the enemy, what exactly have you been doing with all of the money that we've given you for our armed forces? Second thing is that we have great capabilities, and in Russia and in Putin, we are facing a rational opponent. ISIS, I would define as non-rational, by the way. We're facing a rational opponent, much as from our last meeting when we talked about Iran facing off against Israel. Iran is rational as well. Rational means I don't want to have my country and my population destroyed. I don't want to take actions that are going to lead to that to happen. And if that's a risk, I'm going to slow down because that's not good. With all the nuclear weapons we have in the world. But do you think that Putin's hitting a rush? Is he, is he being very rational? I mean, I know people in Putin Russia... Putin's being absolutely rational. He wants people, to establish... His people don't have, you know, there's a lot of parts in Russia that are very, so extremely poor, they don't have enough food, they're, they're, kind they're, of they're housing... Like, kind of sounds like, like the United States. There are parts of this country yeah. that are in the same condition. Oh, wow, we have two minutes to, so to fix Russia right well, now. Well, we can't fix Russia in two minutes, we can't fix our income yeah. and disparity either. So but in I terms guess it's because of, Putin, of their military, they have a they're, they're, they have so many def, uh, Russian nuclear arsenal costs trillions. So, of so we have a nuclear arsenal as well, and we can each kill each other many times. Okay. What Putin wants, and why he is so upset, is that we promised back in the Clinton administration that we would not advance the NATO countries, and we did. Estonia, Latvia, etc., became NATO countries. And that buffer zone that Russia is used to having in terms of it and the West has disappeared into NATO countries. Then when Ukraine started talking to NATO about, gee, membership there yeah. might be attractive to me, that was one of the that catalysts. That probably made him pretty mad. Putin, that one of the catalysts for Putin angry. that because now it's right on his doorstep and he wants buffer protection around his country. And we have to tell our viewers, a lot of them that don't know it, that. Russia is not part of NATO. They were never accepted in NATO. They never and here, applied. No. And here, well, they probably knew they wouldn't be accepted. That's probably why they didn't apply. But the uh, countries that they feel that's part of, like, they, he feels it's Russian territory, even if it isn't, is getting, they like them, you know, they, they may get into NATO. And, what le and that leaves him pretty angry, and I could see him taking it out on NATO. When Harry Truman formed NATO, he formed it specifically to counteract the Iron Curtain, which is what uh, Churchill called it at the time. Stalin responded by creating the Warsaw Pact. When the Soviet Union dissolved, the Warsaw Pact dissolved, NATO remained. The only reason NATO was created was to fight Russia in a land war going across the European continent. And now Russia feels it needs some buffer protection, which leads to some of its behaviors. They make sense. We may not like them, but they make sense. And they said that Russia isn't fighting ISIS in Syria. They are demonstrating their nuclear capability uh, missiles in combat. Right. They are fighting against the enemies of Assad. They're not fighting ISIS. They say we're going to bomb ISIS. The people they bomb are the folks like the Turkmen from this morning who are fighting against Assad. So why aren't they fighting ISIS? What, I mean, they're, they're, ISIS, I mean, you, you would think that they would, that was who they want to, should fight. Because for Russia, the greater threat is the loss of Assad and the loss of that country as a potential buffer state on the periphery of Russia. So keeping Assad, who is... Mm, uh, looks kindly towards Putin in place, therefore becomes more important. Right. So we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, I see my uh, camera people are wrapping it up for me here. Uh, I want to thank my camera staff. I want to thank, thank our uh, producer and all the people that all...